Good evening and welcome to the Tempe City Council oh, right, right, right. work study session. Well, I thought it was going to be for January 17, 2019, here in the Harry E. Mitchell Government Center. The first item on our agenda is our call to the audience for issue review session and committee of the whole items. Audience members have up to three minutes to address the City Council. If you would like to speak on an item, please fill out your speaker's card, which is located in the back of the Council Chambers, um, and give it to our City Clerk staff, and I'll call your name and it's your turn to speak. I do have a couple cards. I'm going to Take them as I received them, in the order I received them. Mr. Amorosi, please state your name and place of residence for the record. Good to see you, Phil. Hello. Phil Amorosi, 1432 East Cedar Street, Tempe. I'm here about uh, item 2A, the uh, private security in the parks. I just want to thank the council for this pilot program. Our, our neighborhood was so desperate. Uh, Hudson Park was uh, being overrun ba basically by criminals that uh, were just destroying the neighborhood. And now since that private security came in, they've they disappeared. It's like they didn't have to even do anything. It's just that they were there. And they were the eyes and the ears. And they were walking through the park. And so these guys didn't have a chance to dismantle stolen bikes. They didn't have a chance to start huffing or doing drugs in the bathroom and, and all that, the nasty stuff that was scaring neighbors. They were just, they took over both Ramadas. We couldn't use anything. And now we got the park back. And uh, I just had a, a neighbor tell me how she lives like a half a block away. And she says, now I don't have a fear of letting my kids run ahead of me to go to the playground. You know, and, and that's the way it should be. You know, I remember when I was a kid, my mom would just say, oh, was that? <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> many, many moons ago. <laughs> but I wanted just to say that that's how it should be. Kids, be. kids should be able to run to their neighborhood park, play in the playground, and not have to worry about seeing some guy shooting up over there. You know, that's uh, so that's all I want to say. And I, I don't think it's the, I'd like to see more park rangers and, and as a permanent solution. Uh, and I think we also need to have a, a shelter with services because we're still finding needles and alleys and near the railroad tracks. So we know it hasn't disappeared. And so if we had those services to talk to people, I think that would be great too. But this program in and of itself was a lifesaver for Hudson Park. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. Like your haircut. Yeah. Looking good, Phil. Next is Mario Martinez. Please state your name and place of residence for the yes. record. Yes. Um, <laughs> my name is Mario Martinez, and I live here in Tempe, and I'm here to address the guard situation. Okay. Um, and I've stated before that uh, I'm, I'm uh, let's see, I'm prepared to accept what the Tempe residents and what the Tempe Council uh, des uh, decides on this matter. Okay. Although I think there's room to disagree on it. I think some of the criticism of it has been, well, I... I would. I think it's kind of hysterical, given the fact that they've been here for a while and they've operated uh, in this way, and there hasn't been problems. Okay, regarding uh, let's see the current situation, I see how it's worked well in Tempe, and in some cases, uh, and in Phoenix. And the example I'd like to point out is with the Burton Bar Library. According to the Arizona Republic, January seventh, there was a guard at the library that disarmed a gunman, okay, disarmed a gunman without, without firing a shot. He was, uh, he, he, he and some other bystanders subdued him and it appeared that, you know, well, if he had a, a gun, he could have killed someone, okay? And this is an example. He did not fire indiscriminately. He just, uh, uh, he subdued the gunman and the police arrested him. 
I feel that it's important, though, if this uh, program goes forward, uh, uh, it's important uh, to do background checks, because when background checks are not effectively done, you have problems. The example that I would like to point out is the Superior Arizona Police Department. They had some very bad problems there. And once again, I'm it was in the media, but it was also in the Arizona Republic on August 15, 2018. They have some bad problems there with the uh, with the um, uh, with the police, including uh, uh, sexual misconduct and some police brutality situations. And what they did is they uh, they there was an investigation. They found out that uh, several of these uh, employees that were employed there were already fired from the police department for other other reasons. Okay, and uh, those are the type of people that uh, I mean. Uh, uh, let's see, they were fired for uh, fighting when drunk, you know, off-duty and lying about background checks and stuff like that. And I think it's important that we have good background checks here. And I don't think that a, uh, for example, an ASU, a former ASU policeman who was, uh, let's see, who, who would quit rather than be fired, who beat up a jaywalker, I, this incident happened right up the street, I don't think that person should be hired as a guard. I don't think uh, that teachers who have been fired for uh, you know sexual misconduct with minors and that should be hired for this position. I mean, I think that we should take this uh, uh, very seriously, and I sincerely hope that these uh, background checks are effective because, like in the case of the Superior Police Department, I mean, that's uh, they're looking for some serious money <laughs> for those cases. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Martinez. Next card I have is Ms. Uh, King Gaffney Rosa. Come on down. State your name and place of residence for the record, even though you're a frequent speaker. Hi, guys. Uh, it's Kim Gaffney Loza, and um, I'm talk I live in North Tempe, and I wanted to speak about the roundabout update. Um, this came about because of our concern um, with speeding down college, and the city responded to us. Um, with the idea of putting a roundabout in that would help slow the traffic down that had been going off Scottsdale Road and coming down College to avoid a lot of the street uh, lights on there. And at first I had a little bit of trepidation about a roundabout because I know there's a lot of people who cross the street there to go to the park, you know, parents with children, uh, bicyclists go down that way, a lot of people walking their dogs. But I think the speeding traffic is more of a danger. And after seeing, um, and I think I told you guys this before, the roundabout up in Sedona during their rush hour and watching all the tourists cross everywhere um, mm -hmm. without any difficulty, I really think it's going to be a good solution for us. So I just want to let you guys know that it has our support in the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is all the cards I have. Is there anyone else in the audience? wishing to address us under any of the items listed on this agenda yes could you please come forward that's okay because on social media i'm pat canolas i live in the mitchell park neighborhood what else am i supposed to say <laughs> okay i'm here because of the um the armed guards of the park certain neighborhoods apparently have really had disturbing problems and for them, this apparently was a good solution. We have not had that type of problems in our parks. There's a great deal of suspicion of, of someone who is not a trained police officer. Even the trained police officers, there's a lot. We got young people that are, you know, anti-police. I'm not, but I am concerned about too much shooting. I, I am definitely against any gun activity. And I feel that our particular neighborhood would not want to have armed guards unless they were part of the, what do you call them? Not the posse. <clears throat> the, the two that, what? Police Department? Ranger. Well, Ranger. Park Rangers? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> the Park Rangers. And that's really, I just wanted you to know that we're all not happy, happy about the idea of having armed guards at all. Um, I, we have not seen guns in our parks in, God, at 
at least a decade that I know of, unless it was on the holster of a genuine police officer. So that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you, Pat. You. Thank you, Pat. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to address us on any of the items listed on the work uh, study session agenda, as well as the committee of the whole items? Could you please get my attention? Seeing none, I'll close that portion of the public hearing items, and I will now look to the first item on our issue review session, which is a park security pilot program update. Chief Moore. and council. I'm Sylvia Moyer. I serve as your police chief and I am here before you this evening in response to a request that you made to report back on our park security pilot program. Tonight I will present what got us here, some data and some key things to consider and know. So we know that in 2017 and 2018 a community survey reflected the results on feeling of safety in our parks here in Tempe. The community survey showed that there was decreased confidence and increased fear related to safety in the parks. Well, we examine what our community feels so that we can be informed and take action. The feeling of safety in the parks had diminished. Community meetings reflected concern by members of our community and individuals were giving us feedback in a number of ways uh, related to how they felt about the parks. Largely, folks were telling us that they didn't feel that the parks were places where they could go with their families, and we grew increasingly concerned. Our pilot to use G4S to address the conditions in our parks was just that. It was a pilot with a trusted partner who had demonstrated that they were professional and committed in providing safety. And we also know that this is a top 10% council priority. Priority 1.23 reflects feeling of safety in parks. So we engaged and took action and we rolled out with the financial support of this council, we rolled out G4S into our parks. <coughs> but we did not do this quickly. We did not take this endeavor lightly. We connected with our trusted partners in G4S and we expanded the scope of work and we dove into very specific demands. And I'm going to describe some of those for you after I give you a sense of what we found in the very brief time that we've had this pilot underway. So let's dive into some quick data. Just a quick snapshot we have found a 57% decrease in calls for service since the park rollout. That is important because a call for service, for our understanding, is a citizen-generated call, where a member of our community says there's a condition or a behavior occurring in a park that gives rise to them calling the emergency or non-emergency number of the Tempe Police Department, saying we need a police officer to come and investigate this behavior or condition. Since October of 2018, this 57% decrease is significant. We've also seen in this very brief pilot, a 40% decrease in street checks and a 30% decrease in arrest bookings. Let me help you make sense of this. <coughs> this is really important because we have a belief that non-punitive action is important in Tempe. In fact, we were told to be 10% more compassionate. And we believe that, that inserting G4S into the parks <coughs> in the manner in which they engage with folks is an intermediate step. It's prior to police department involvement. And often people say that contact with the police is <coughs> a gateway into the justice system. This council reflected their values and our community has said, 
We don't want just heavy enforcement everywhere. We want trusted professionals that can discern if someone needs to be held accountable to the rule of law, they need services or some intermediate measure. And since the insertion of G4S, we believe that's an intermediate measure. You want to know what a street check is, I'm sure, sir. Yes. yes. So, <laughs> Council Member Keating and others are probably saying, well, okay, well, what is a street check? A street check is this. A police officer comes into contact with a member of, of the public. It doesn't give rise to a citation or an arrest, but there's a documentation of that interaction. And what that means is there's been a 40% decrease in those interactions. That's a significant number, and thank you for asking. You're probably now wondering, what is an arrest booking? That is the physical detention of a person and an arrest through the booking process. It's important to note through this whole thing that arrest is an appropriate intervention for a criminal action. And contrary to the, the opinions of some uninformed people, we do not have quotas. We do not tell officers when they need to effect an arrest. They are trained professionals who can determine if an arrest is appropriate in a given circumstance. So the fact that we're reporting to you, even this, in this immature, very young pilot, that arrests are down 30% is something to take note of. G4S represents uh, an extra presence at parks. And this is the way that we have made the effort to increase the feeling of safety. G4S has proven in other parts of our city that they are trusted professionals to provide safety. Some of the snapshot keys, some folks have said, well, what is the purpose of G4S? And we told them it's to improve the feeling of safety in our parks so everyone can enjoy them. We told them that their mission, the expectation of the individuals and the organization is to be a positive, visible presence to be the eyes and ears, to educate, to mitigate, and to enforce. And enforcement, if mitigation is unsuccessful, the first step that our G4S folks do is they ask people to leave the park for a 24-hour period. If not successful or if the situation is aggravated, G4S is instructed to call the police and we would intervene. So the training that G4S engaged in upon accepting our ask of them in this pilot was two days, and I'll lightly touch on those. The folks that were selected went through La Frontera Impact Mental Health First Aid Training, and that is, in essence, awareness of mental illness signs, symptoms, and communication strategies, basically de-escalation of people that face, uh, that have mental illness. It's the same full day training that our officers receive. The, they also uh, receive training in code of conduct. And from our esteemed prosecutor, Bill Burke, they received training on documentation, how to be a good witness. We received training on implicit bias. Human, human services, our outreach team, and CARE 7 trained them. And they had a lunch, lunch with a success story. A, a young man named Ron with Tempe Works presented over the lunchtime about his experience with homeless in our parks. And Ron knows from a very interesting perspective. Ron was once homeless, and one evening he was contacted by a Tempe police officer who informed Ron about eye help. Over the next coming weeks, Ron explored this further. It was eventually housed in eye help until he was able to obtain a housing voucher. That all occurred because of the social services we have in Tempe, the training and the character of the Tempe police officers. And Ron is a success story as a result. He now is part of the Tempe works team and he gave that training. He also discussed with the G4S folks about awareness, empathy, communication strategies, and safety, and they engaged in strategies at Hudson Park. If Mr. Mark, you has a question. Uh, yes, about training to you. Yes, ma'am. So um, could we consider offering the, uh, the crisis intervention training, CIT training, 
to our security guards in the parks? I know it's it's a week long. There'd be cost for you know paying the to attend the uh, training, but it is a free training as well. Could that be part of our training? Nothing's off the table. It's a pilot, and we have <coughs> found that Gary Pellerin and the the team in G4S is open to an array of of things uh, because they find great meaning in providing this work in our community. So we could certainly explore that. That's the will of the council. Uh, Councilmember Erdano Savage. Well, I mean, I think like I think like she said, I don't think anything's off the table. But I think to just get the information would be really helpful. Sure. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you because I was going to talk about something else really quick. And and I just have a, a brief conclusion, little wrap up, and then open to any questions that you have. Of I just ask you one question about G4S, and I know that there's been um, a, a a lot of concern in the community about utilizing that organization. Can you kind of just share a little bit about your experience and the local experience? And why you're confident in the NG for us? Well, I can tell you, uh, our officers report, and my understanding and my own experience is that uh, Gary, the manager of the local G4S, is open to training. He's open to a number of explorations that I haven't found with other companies. He has a high level of accountability. The men and women he selects are highly certified and trained. Uh, they're certified in the state and they perform work here that I think reflects our highest values, that they want to help, they want to mitigate, they want to educate, they want to connect people to services, and where necessary, they intervene in order to eliminate a threat. And we found them to be extraordinarily professional, and that's why I have such high confidence in this pilot. And and although it's not fully mature, I think by the end we'll find some, some very interesting results. Uh, I think as a part of that, something that's important in the, in the profession of policing, one of the things that we talk about quite broadly is the presence of, the, of a capable guardian as a disruptor of crime. And nationally, the presence of a capable guardian is most widely known as uh, a man or a woman in a marked police car in a marked police uniform. It's accepted and backed by evidence that that mere insertion of that person often disrupts the crime triangle. And it could be a uniformed police officer. There are other kind of uniform capable guardians such as G4S. And I think that's why we're seeing some of the results coupled with the professionalism of the men and women that are deployed. So just briefly, I'll tell you, it is early. This is not fully mature. We are examining in an ongoing and examining the data, examining how the guards feel, how people feel, and we're, we're really listening. It's, it's one approach to a number of issues. It's far too early to draw conclusions, but we're optimistic. Ultimately, based on a successful model implemented Right here in Tempe, G4S is providing an extra visible presence in that capable guardian and possible disruptor of crime, as I described, uh, in addressing the behavior in our parks. And many of those around our parks have demanded it, and this city and your police <coughs> department are responsive in addressing community needs. At the same time, we're attempting to be responsive to the concerns for those who do not want to see uh, homeless unnecessarily burdened by citations and arrests unless absolutely necessary. This insertion of G4S in the parks is not solely about homelessness. It's about crime and the fear of crime. And the current intermediate, intermediate approach usually using G4S appears at least early on to be finding this balance of what this council and this community wants. And the goal outcome is that we, it will help us enhance overall our feeling of safety in parks reduce harm, and foster trust. And that concludes my very brief update. Councilman Navarro, then Councilman Keating. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Chief, thank you for the report, and, and thank you for uh, the, the information, the presentation. Um, I think it's so valuable to understand and for our, our community to understand. Um, you know, for this council, I, I think for a number of years, we've been getting emails um, at our parks. What are you guys going to do? What's going on? We need more cops. We need more people out here. We need to be visible. And we're trying to figure out ways and ways and ways to do this. And I think Tempe does a great job on trying to think outside the box. Tempe Works Program is a perfect example, um, getting homeless uh, involved in working within Tempe and then getting them on their way. In my opinion, when this 
issue came up maybe about four years ago in Escalante Park about how do we take back our park, how do we get um, our, our uh, community residents to be more involved in our park, G4S was, was the answer. Yes. And, and, and what I found out a long time ago was they developed a rapport um, with the people out there. They were able to understand you know, their needs, their wants. They were able to have a relationship. They were able also just to educate. But not only that, it was, to your point, it also showed the community that, that your parks are secure. It wasn't a threat. It was more of, of an involvement of, of the city, you know, making sure that we are safe within our parks. Um, so knowing what happened in Escalante and seeing what happened in Escalante, I thought this program would be beneficial. And I think that when it first rolled out, I was very supportive of making sure that we, we test this out. And, and what's tremendous about it is the ability to um, have that dialogue with, with the people that so-called reside there in the park to try to get them a better place, better help, and also making sure that no one's doing anything inappropriate. Um, and I think that's been um, said by a number of emails we've had recently, how secure our parks feel now yes. um, on the presence. But with your information, your data to drop in terms of calls of service and things like that, that's a cop that's not responding to a park, but is on the, spe on the street responding, responding to something else of need. And uh, I just think it's such a value. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, with more information, we can even better it, tweak it. I, there was great information from Council Member Kuby. Um, I know that there's always uh, up and coming classes um, that goes for police and fire and everybody when it comes to mental health. And um, we always need to take uh, advantage of those um, monies when they come from the federal government, especially. So mm -hmm. I think this is a just an extension of what the police department does. And it's a huge value for this city, um, for all the things that this city does for homelessness and to help make sure our um, parks are secured. This is outstanding. Councilman Keating. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you very much for the report, Chief. I, I do appreciate the information. Um, as you remember, when we first approved this pilot program, you know, there was um, some backlash from the community. Uh, there's a lot of hyperbole being thrown around, um, you know, militarization, <coughs> someone's going to get shot, and somehow the council doesn't care. It's not a priority for us, which, of course, is ridiculous. Um, but the numbers you have showed us uh, just today, you know, the 57% 50, decrease in calls for service, 40% decrease in, in officer to civilian contacts, if I'm understanding that street check correctly, and a 30% decrease in arrest booking, we're seeing really just the opposite has played out. Our parks have not become destabilized. In fact, they are much more stable mm -hmm. and um, much more, um, you know, welcoming than maybe they were before. So mm -hmm. in my mind, you know, the, the, the point of this pilot program was crime prevention, and that v very clearly is, is working. Um, now, the debate has kind of shifted a little bit and I think, you know, even now with your presentation, it will shift more because I'm not sure there will be people that really deny that this is a benefit to the city of Tempe and the parks that, that we're targeting. But it now it's kind of shifted to, well, why do the guards have to be armed? Mm -hmm. So I guess I have two questions around that. Um, is, are, are you having any discussions? Um, is that something you guys are, are looking at? Is that something you're considering, uh, disarming the guards? And... Um, as a follow-up to that, would disarming the guards, would that, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, would that uh, inhibit their ability to, to be law enforcement figures in the parks? So I think there are a number of things to consider. We made the decision related to deploying armed guards in the park, primarily because of the complex nature of the human interactions that occur there. That coupled with the fact that for a G4S guard to be armed, they endure a much deeper background examination and a higher level of certification through G4S and through the state of Arizona. And those factors gave us great confidence that the men and women that would accept such incredible responsibility to be armed and proficient in how a firearm is used and they are certified, that gave us uh, great confidence that those were the types of men and women that we wanted to deploy. So you're saying um, the, the armed guards are, are much more highly trained than an unarmed guard would be and you think that that is a more appropriate figure for the parks than maybe an unarmed guard would be? Is that higher correct? training, higher certification, and the background, the background. is much more in-depth. And those factors, I think, give us 
uh, we took notice. And those are the, the types of folks that, that we want deployed in that very often chaotic space. I have one more question, if you don't mind, Councilmember Adams. No worries. Um, <clears throat> A lot of a lot of was made about you know this is kind of targeting the homeless and you know I we've talked endlessly about how that's mm -hmm. not really the case and if you're homeless you're much more likely to be a victim of a crime than than commit a crime and all that and um, you know those are figures and numbers that are backed up and I, I firmly believe it. I guess my question is, has there been any example where a homeless person has accused? G4S or Tempe police of harassment based on just the fact they're homeless or is a homeless person been arrested or has there been any complaints about somebody being ejected from the park unlawfully during the course of this pilot? I'm not aware of any. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Adams. Um, thanks, Chief. Uh, the stats are very impressive that you had uh, today. And I just would um, propose that perhaps one size doesn't fit all in, in our parks. Perhaps some parks uh, do need armed guards, uh, given their history, and some could go, we could use park rangers that, nece that aren't necessarily arrived. So I would just like us to consider that in the future, perhaps a combination of the G4s when they're, when they're, um, when you see them as necessary and park rangers when you don't. Chief, I, I, I want to, Thank you for the update. And I want to, you know, when you and our city manager, Mr. Ching, introduced this pilot program um, we, to us, we heard a lot from our residents um, about certain types of activity in the parks that they didn't feel safe. And that's really what the essence is, and I think it shows here. I know the council has received emails from residents from Clark Park and other areas of the city that we've had this pilot program stating um, the impact of having um, guards in, in our parks and, and what that means and to really I want to I can't underscore enough how much um, the city of Tempe our residents and this council have invested in our parks quality of life we have a park every square mile throughout our city and making sure that our residents feel safe and we've invested hundreds and thousands of dollars <coughs> not millions of dollars in our CIP our own park system to get them usable and up-to-date and making sure that every citizen regardless of who you are, feel safe in their park. That's the essence of the calls that we have heard. And when the city manager and the, and the chief came back to us with this program, it's a pilot. We're still in the input stages. There's a lot that's going to be gone. I, I, I you know, what Vice Mayor Kubi mentioned regarding additional training, if they're open, I'm, I think that would be great. We can never have enough information out there for our residents um, to make sure that, you know, we're trying to help people. Having that human contact is so important and it just shows the type of caring community that the city of Tempe is. So I really want to thank you for that. Councilman Granville? Uh, yeah, I was wondering, uh, first of all, I just want to chime in to make sure there's enough people who have said this to make sure. Uh, I agree that I would like to see the week-long training that Councilmember Vice Mayor QB has talked about. Um, I think the more training, the better. Um, I'm curious if you've seen a, and I haven't heard this anecdotally, I'm just curious, a game of sort of bop -a -mole where once you move uh, G4S into Clark Park or Daly Park, wherever the case may be, that it has pushed um, those people who don't feel comfortable having G4S see what they do into other parks or alleys or is it a question of where we're going to have to expand the program because we're pushing to other areas or do you feel like um, G4S has been such that individuals have just sort of moved on to another city or simply stopped that behavior in a public way? So in terms of uh, tracking folks, I think that's really in the domain of our homeless outreach folks. We can tell you that Commander Michael Horn is responsible for the deployment. Something that he has done is he has remained agile in how he deploys G4S and- it's Like a four part rotation. No, sir. Oh, okay, that makes uh, sense. What I found is he's taken a, a great approach to vary and stagger, really, the days and times of, of G4S and district officers to <coughs> go to the parks. Um, so we're not experiencing where uh, a whack-a-mole where we sure. get. So um, we're not experiencing uh, an increase so significant somewhere else that we feel that we've displaced the, the problem. Uh, we remain agile and open to where we see an uptick in volume or activity that is not 
uh, that may give rise to discomfort, fear, or crime. And the other comment I just want to make is, uh, by the way, the statistics are wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, it's exactly what we, were, we expected to see, and it's, it's good that it panned out. It surprised us. Actually. Really? Because I, no, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Uh, I think to take the comment that uh, Councilmember Adams and, and Keating made, just a little bit differently. I think a lot of those statistics that you see, uh, I understand the training side of it for the for carrying guns, I, but the training could happen with or without the guns. Um, and my concern is that without uh, body-worn cameras, um, without being subject to FOIA requests, uh, if something went wrong, we would hope it never would, but if something went wrong, we would be in a G4S and in lieu us uh, just as sort of an interested third party, uh, we would be in a precarious situation to be in anything but a he said, she said situation. Um, I, I think that, that that's a, a, a scary situation to me where uh, G4S mm -hmm. does have to use their weapon and there's no way to know what exactly the truth was because everyone's talking about their perceptions of the truth. Um, and so whether that's body-worn cameras or whether that's not having the weapons, I think uh, I just never want to be in that situation or put G4S in that situation um, of having to uh, be in that awkward situation of, of you know, what really happened, right? I, I, that's not a good place to put them. It's not a good place to put a person subject to that. And it's not a good place to put the city of Tempe. I hear you. I can say that body-worn camera footage is evident. And in our conversations with Gary of G4S, he said that would actually help me for uh, resolving complaints. Uh, it may insert some civility. Or, or liability folks, issues, yeah. Certainly. Uh, so I don't think anything, in a, particularly in a pilot and in a department like ours, we're open to considering an array of things. And so Commander Horn has engaged in conversation already with G4S about if we decide to deploy body-worn cameras for your folks, then what? If yes, then who pays? If yes, yes, then, and a number of things. So he's explored that. And if directed, we could uh, explore it further. I do think it's preliminary at this time, but I hear your concern. To go to Council Member Adam's point, maybe even if it's not feasible to do it in all of the parks, but maybe in the, in the one or two situations where you know there's a heightened risk as a beta test, even something along those lines, I think would be appropriate. Vice Mayor Kiwi. Then Councilman Arredondo Savage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chief Moyer, I, I asked some questions of your staff and your office, <clears throat> um, loving the data, but also kind of questioning it. And 57% uh, reduction in, in calls it seemed very significant to me and I asked about how much money had been spent during that time frame of October 22nd to the present. And I was surprised to hear, and I'm pleasantly surprised, that it's $36,000 it's been expended in the program. Just over, yes. Yeah, um, which is relative, it's a lot less than I expected. Um, since the soft implementation, October 22nd, that was Hudson and Clark, and full implementation began in early December. But then when you think about the reduction calls, I, I asked, what is this time frame? And it is from the time of soft Im implementation, so early October. Um, so I asked about what's the same time frame from last year, December 2017 to December 2018. All parks saw 39% decrease, decrease in calls for service. So that could argue the 56% isn't as striking. But then, this is what really piqued my interest. The G4S parks had a 65% decrease and calls for service. So that's a real, you know, more of a controlled situation where you can compare parks that didn't have the service to parks that did and seeing an actual decrease in calls to service. So I know there's lots of factors that could come into play if you look at all parks. There could be other things going on in, in society or, you know, just you don't know. But to me, that was a really telling statistic. So thank you so much for the ableness of um, your staff and getting that data to me. But also listening, thinking about the, the cost savings, because I have had residents say, why does this have to be private? Why not just employ police officers? And they even have made disparaging comments like this is just a rent-a-cop business. Um, when you compare the number of hours of GPS, G4S to a sworn officer, and I realize a sworn officer, I'm just talking about salary and benefits and insurance. There's a lot of other costs like insurance and the cars and the equipment. But we've seen a $64,000 savings. We spent 36 
thousand, we saved sixty-four thousand. So, in some ways, this program is is really cost efficient. I know that's not the only factor. There's a lot of factors, but I just thought that was very telling as well. Um, and we see other savings, and then we're not using the car as an equipment and vehicle of the Tempe PD, but this company. So I just thought it gave another um, picture that was all, you know, I was asking critical questions, and the, and the results were really, I was pleasant, not surprised, but I was, I was pleased. Uh, I do want to note that it's striking that everyone that's written to us about their approaching the officers in the park have had positive things to say about the officers, that they were polite and professional or friendly, and um, they said they had no fear about their own safety. And this is 201, like everyone that's written to it about a specific interaction with one of the, the officers in the park. So I would encourage our, our neighbors, our residents, to, to go out and greet the officers and talk to them and ask about their experiences. I think it only creates more community-mindedness and will alleviate some of the concerns that can sometimes be hypothetical and not you know, real based on reality. So thank you so much. Councilmember Irdano Savage. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chief. I really appreciate it. I, first and foremost, I think uh, Councilmember, I mean, Vice Mayor just brought up a really good point is this is such a new pilot program. I think a lot of people feel like it's been around a little bit longer than it has, but with the soft implementation in early October or late October, if I remember right, and then just early December, we're only talking about full implementation just a little over a month. So to be able to track this data, I think, is so valuable, mm -hmm. and I really do appreciate it. So I... I look forward to, first and foremost, you being very flexible as we work through this pilot program and then coming back with some suggestions in regards to what this could look like. Maybe it evolves within the pilot, but what that long-term um, vision is going to look like to, to make sure that our parks continue to stay safe, because I think that's the ultimate goal, obviously. Um, and I do appreciate, I think, uh, also what the vice mayor said in regards to the feedback we've been getting from the residents. I really do appreciate it. I know we don't always agree, but it's been really nice to hear that the interactions with our residents and um, the guards that are out there has been really positive. And I think that's, does, I don't take that lightly. I think that's really, really impressive. And a lot of that has to go back to the training. And when we talk about the training, I'm not necessarily saying commit to the one-week training. I, I don't want anybody to think I, I said that. I want you to explore that to see if that can become part of it. Because obviously, there's a lot more to it than saying, yes, we're going to send everybody to train for a week. I completely understand that. And I think that should be in the bigger scope of what you're doing, I think, with, with all of our employees and how we move forward with that. But I do, I do definitely support the idea of, of moving forward with the exploration of, of more trainings. I think that's a good idea, whether it's now in the pilot or when we actually work on something to be implemented full time, um, whatever that may be. So I would just say, you know, moving forward for me, I want to say thank you to you and your team and to the residents for speaking out. Um, and I know a lot of it has to do with the philosophy as, as we move forward. But I will say that I think that when we threw this challenge at you, you took it, you ran with it, and you created something that could be implemented quickly. And I do certainly do appreciate that. And I think the statistics and the data really shows that it is changing behaviors. And that's exactly what we wanted to. We want people to be able to utilize <coughs> the park. And, and we have spent and we've invested a lot of money in our parks. So it's really, really important that our residents have the ability to utilize them. So not just now, in the future. So I look at it from my perspective is I think there's still more to be learned. I think that I will appreciate it when you come back to us, you know, a little bit later and, and give us maybe another update in a few months and, and say this is what's working and this is what's not and maybe this is where we can make some changes to that. So, like I said, I, I want to just say thank you um, for you and your team for the work that you're doing. Much appreciated. Is it, thank you. Can I ask the council, is it consensus that we asked the chief to explore the training that was referenced and see if it fits with what we're trying to do and if it works that because you are open and flexible as well as G4S that you would come back and let us know if it was acceptable for what the intent is yes and then also you know if the council if it's okay with the council that we could you know in another couple months i mean we got march you know continue to give us updates as the progress of this pilot program so that we can be well informed i think that's something that's important friday packet would be friday fine. packet would be fine too councilmember keating then councilmember navarro uh, thank you mayor I, i'm sorry i didn't mention this earlier i didn't think we'd be giving direction at this meeting or at this uh, presentation but if my colleagues agree, could we also, if we're going to look at the training, can we also look at what an uh, unarmed solution would look mm -hmm. like in the parks? Um, you know, I don't want to put public safety at risk at all, but if we can explore that option, um, I think that would be 
a good thing. Good program. Not be part of the discussion. I mean, I would expect to hear that recommendation coming back. I just want to make sure it comes back. Is kind of what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I agree with Randy. Mayor, it was just a question of the chief, and I know that when new mental health training always comes up through whatever channels, so by federal government or what, I don't know, does does the relationship, if it's offered to Tempe Police Department, can it be applied to G4S to get the same training? It's a great question. I'll have to explore that as part of the exploration if they're open to it and then yeah. the other ramifications. Right. Certainly. Anybody else have any questions? Chief, thank you. I think you have direction. Yes, sir. Thank you for the update. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item on our agenda is our update on the Innovation Funds Project. Um, I do know that we have a, a good memo in our packet. Does any council members have any questions on the Innovation Funds? Really well written. That was good. It was good? All right. Oh, then, that's the fastest item ever. <laughs> next is roundabouts. If Shelly could come on down. Mayor and Council, Shelley Seiler, Deputy Public Works Director for Transportation, and with me is Julie Andreessing, our City Traffic Engineer, and we are here tonight to give you an update on the roundabouts. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for having me. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. A lot of these slides are something that most of you have seen. Um, Council Member Adams, they may be a little new to you, and so if you have questions, okay. feel free to jump in, but I'm going to try to move through this rather quickly. Um, we presented, uh, the last time we presented on roundabouts was in March of the last year. And what we're coming to you now is with, um, to, get, to provide, if we could get some feedback from you. Um, we've gone out to the public, had public meetings, and we've also, um, we're ending our design process and so I have a better idea of costs at this point. And so the, those two items are going to weigh in on kind of how we move forward. The two performance measures that these that roundabouts relate to are our Vision Zero goal of providing a safe roadway system for our residents and visitors and anybody that's uh, using our streets, as well as um, our uh, goal to reduce congestion. And so roundabouts have the benefit of um, working towards both of those performance measures. Uh, what are roundabouts? Roundabouts are an intersection. They can be single lane or they can be multi-lane. Uh, what roundabouts are not, they are not large rotary style intersections like um, I included a picture of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Uh, very large, this is not what we're talking about here, nor is it small like uh, the neighborhood traffic circle that uh, included a picture from the Mitchell Park neighborhood. So we're, it's, it's kind of in between these two. For those of you, uh, I think most of us have had the opportunity to uh, go through a roundabout. For those of you who might be new to you, how do you... Uh, Go through a roundabout, you slow down, you yield to any pedestrians that may be uh, present in your path, you yield to vehicles that are already in the circle, you then enter the circle, and then uh, you can go right, go through, go left, make a U-turn, and then uh, once again as you're leaving the roundabout, you will yield to any pedestrians that could be there and then exit on your way. Why are we considering constructing roundabouts? There's two main reasons, uh, those being safety and also capacity and delay, and so I've included some um, research that's taken place and uh, by the Federal Highway Administration as well as ADOT and IHS and you can see that there's definite safety benefits that are correlated with the installation of roundabouts as well as um, delay benefits and that's really for, due to the fact that um, at, a, at a typical signalized intersection somebody always has a red light when the other has green at a roundabout if there's nobody um, there then you can just enter the roundabout you yield and you just move through so it can be run very efficiently. Uh, some of you might remember this from last time, I thought I'd throw this in again, but um, this really speaks to uh, perception about roundabouts. So initially, uh, NCHRP did a study and asked people their perception about roundabouts, and um, before roundabout went in, the perception was more on the negative side, and then afterwards they asked the same people uh, what their perceptions were, and you can really see the switch that, um, that it changed from negative to uh, positive. So it's, as people learn to understand them, uh, they're, they're relatively new in, in, uh, in many communities, including City of Tempe, so uh, I think that's what that speaks to. Can I ask <coughs> about the green eggs and ham? Is that because I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, and then I try it and I like it? Is that what that is? That was, the, that was kind of the, the idea was. I, I, 
I, I'm not, I don't want green eggs and ham. I don't like them, Sam, I am. But then I after, just, after, I just took it as an icon. I didn't even yeah. think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Very clever. I but after, 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 there, he eats, yeah. after he eats them, he says, I do like, like these green eggs and ham. So like that for me. <laughs> Throw something fun in there. No comment. Very, very, <laughs> clever. very clever. Very clever. That's all. So there's three roundabouts that we're currently in the process of designing and uh, designing, and one is going to construction for sure. Uh, the first is in the north part of the city. This is at the intersection of College and McKellops. I'll speak a little bit uh, about why we chose that location. Of course, we have the Fifth <coughs> Ash Rio intersection that's um, in concert with the streetcar project, and then in the south part of the city, we're looking at a, a roundabout at Priest and Grove Parkway, which is a multi-lane roundabout. The other, uh, the first being a single. So at Priest and Grove Parkway, we did an engineering study. Um, we analyzed it for signal warrants, which is a federal uh, process that we go through and we're trying to figure out whether an intersection needs additional traffic control. Uh, I met four of those warrants. You can see that the traffic volumes are fairly high with 23,000 vehicles a day on Priest and then about 7,000 vehicles on Grove Parkway. Uh, a significant amount of crashes when we're looking at a three-year period of 36 and so um, as a result, the results of that study based on the, the warrants, the crash analysis, and, um, and such, has, our recommendation was to install a signal or a roundabout. Um, normally, we would just move forward with a signal. In this case, it's the, it's the intersection of two curved roadways. And so there's some concern with that point of putting in a signal on a curve and then the vehicles coming around the curve and not realizing the signal's there and running the signal. And so, we looked at other options and um, found that a roundabout is, a, is another alternative beside the signal, but um, has some benefits of slowing down drivers. And uh, we thought this was a, a, a good location to, um, to move forward with the roundabout. The second location is at College of McKellops. It's, um, we again, we completed a study. It's an existing signal, but it only met one of the warrants. And that was during peak hours, which pretty much any intersection in the city of Tempe at this time during peak out rush hours would meet that warrant. Traffic volumes are much less when you're looking at college at 7,000 and McKellops at two. And um, the three-year study period, we only had a single crash there. So very different uh, situation. This, what really was driving this one was um, meeting with the neighborhoods and they had concerns about college and uh, traffic on college, especially with some of the development that's happening there on the north part of the lake. And so we were trying to come, with, come up with some solutions that, um, that would slow down drivers, but also create some identity for the neighborhood. Um, you can landscape. It's got the uh, Hallman Park there. So we we're um, looking at how can we make this kind of an entrance treatment and also slow down drivers so it's kind of multifaceted. So we had uh, public meetings. Um, the first was in uh, Precinct Grove Parkway, September 26th. We, we did all our normal outreach in Facebook and, um, and postcards. We met with the, all the individual businesses in that area. This location is um, much more business oriented, multifamily as opposed to the one up north, and I'll speak to that one next. Uh, we opened it up for public comment online, and um, overall, the, the businesses were very in favor of this. We had uh, the few concerns that we did have were related to um, pedestrians and bicycle safety in the area. And uh, one thing that we, we, we um, thought might be an option is on the bottom right, there's a picture there of a, a Rapid, a rectangular rapid flash beacon, and so it's something that a pedestrian could push a button and just alert vehicles in the area that, uh, that their intent was to enter the roadway. So I think that uh, seemed like it met some of the most of people's uh, concerns in the area. Right now it's uncontrolled, so there's no crosswalks, and so definitely this is a better option than what's the, there currently. What you were talking about, the beacons, there's just like lights in the ground. Is it those like Chandler has? Is there a sign? I have no idea. I saw it in Chandler. I think the, the ground lights actually flash. They have some in-pavement ones. Um, we've looked into those, and there's some real maintenance issues that come along with that, if you can imagine having it in the roadway. So um, other cities have had good luck. These are just mounted on the sign, and so they're dark, kind of like the hawk signals. They're dark, and so if, if a driver does see the flashing lights, they know that, that there's a pedestrian present. So. Um, uh, so the, the main issue that we've come across with, with this one, and I'll note it with the next one too, has come down to cost. So we've gone through the full design. Um, when we were budgeting this, we really did our best <laughs> effort to talk to other communities in the valley and find out what the cost that they were seeing for this. And so uh, we originally had 600000 budgeted for construction, and we're expecting the, this one to come in at just over $1 million. So we have a $486,000 shortfall. And so it's a combination of... The, these being our first roundabouts as well as we just know that construction costs are about 40% higher 
Um, so there's a number of reasons, but um, so th that's the uh, precinct Grove Parkway roundabout. Uh, at College of McKellops, once again, we had a public meeting. We had much more um, uh, involvement at this. This is a, a much more residential neighborhood. And so um, we had really good attendance at our public meeting, as well as through our online public comment. And uh, once again, the, the major concern that was kind of brought up is uh, had related to pedestrians and bicyclists and that. Um, currently, it's signalized, and so the, the concern was that now we're moving that signalization car stop at the red, and now that wouldn't exist. Um, we did do the best we could to share resources from uh, the Federal Highway Administration, others showing that and documenting that these are safe for pedestrians. Uh, one key factor <coughs> is that a pedestrian only has to cross one um, direction of travel at a time. So uh, you, you can cross one leg of traffic, then st stop on the island, and then wait till there's a gap in the other and cross. So as opposed to a typical intersection where you're crossing at least two lanes, if not more. Um, but once again, we, uh, we brought up the concept of putting in the rectangular rapid flash beacons. And uh, for most uh, our attendants, that seemed to help uh, cause some of those fears. But once again, uh, we uh, had 400,000 budget for next fiscal year for construction, and the, and the costs are coming in about uh, double that, $861,000. So, um, it's the mark. So, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it, it, it's something that we're seeing on our construction projects across the board, uh, just the, the increased costs in um, concrete, steel, just in general. You just saw that at MAG with uh, the projects that we have. There's actually been a 68 percent increase in cost. Yeah. Councilman Navarro. Yeah. Are you? Uh, once you finish up, and I'll. Okay. Sure. So we're coming with you with uh, three options, uh, based on the the feedback that we've gotten, and as well as the cost. So the first being, uh, since we can't fully fund both of these with the current adopted budget, as well as what we had uh, planned for next fiscal year, we could just um, postpone both projects and look at future options, including in future CIP processes. The second is to uh, move forward with the Priest and Grove Parkway roundabout uh, next fiscal year. So we had some money this fiscal year. We could push that to next fiscal year and then reprogram the money that was um, planned for the College and McKellops intersection. And that puts us about where the costs were projecting for Priest and Grove Parkway. Uh, we'd have to add a little bit of additional funding next fiscal year to about $100,000. The reason that this is really an option is um, College of McKellops currently does have signalization. They currently do have um, control at that intersection, whereas Priest and Grove Parkway is uncontrolled. And um, at, from what I pointed out earlier, there's more crashes and more traffic and such. So we, from a traffic engineering standpoint, we kind of feel that that one has a little bit of a higher need just based on current conditions. Not to say that College of McKellops isn't um, a good candidate as well. And the third option is obviously to move forward with both, but really um, we have some budgeting issues that we'd have to move forward with to, uh, to do that. So. Councilman Navarro. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have to agree on the options. Um, obviously, I think the one down south is, is of safety needs and probably needs to be done first. Um, I would also you know, be entertained at doing the two, um, the one down south on Priest and then the one over here on Ash. Um, as part of the uh, continuation, because we have the light rail and stuff going through there and, and everything else, I think I'd, I, I would probably favor those two to get done. Um, the other questions I had were uh, landscape and then making sure, obviously, that's one of the things, trees, landscape, it fits in with, with what we're doing within that area. I don't know if it's going to be just a stamp of just the same stuff and all the roundabouts, but I hope it has character for that area. Um, and then in addition to that, we have arts funding, I think, that's coming in, and does it qualify for any art? You know, we see the Mitchell Park, how they have in their roundabouts, um, some art sculptures or, or something with in the middle of the roundabout. If we have art money that would help offset that cost, um, that would be a huge consideration to use, utilize that money also. Um, I've never been a fan, fan true fan, uh, especially in the neighborhoods. I, I just don't think it's appropriate. I think what you guys presented is very appropriate and, and, and smart um, to put roundabouts there. I think it, it, it fits well. Um, it's not look. It doesn't look like as if we're shoving a roundabout in the in the intersection. So um, I agree with what you guys put together, and and those would be my suggestions. Okay, and I could just speak to the uh, the landscaping. You'll notice on these pictures, um, the top right corner showing uh, the, what the roundabout is, and then the left being the uh, palette. So the designers that we did work with um, had landscape architects, and uh, I think they did a, an excellent job with including. 
um, features that match the area, particularly with uh, College of McKellops having Hallman Park there and some of the existing landscape medians along there, kind of desert landscaping. We're looking at um, matching that. So for sure, landscaping would be a, a key component of this. There's no reason why, why art couldn't be included at some point in the future. I believe in the last presentation I shared that we showed what some other communities had done, and they've done some really neat things. So it's, it's uh, definitely an opportunity to add aesthetics there in the center circle as well. Um, and that could be landscaping or art. So I think option two is something that I think is looking at the safety aspect. And, and that's probably the first and foremost attribute that we look at as a council. And seeing the number of incidents that have happened there, I think it will go a long way in completing this project. And then we can look at the other projects as a future years of a CIP. So I think it's important. Um, so I, I am, especially with the safety concerns, you have 36 crashes in three years. Um, I mean, that says a lot. So if we're committed to safety, which we are, I think it's important that option two is one that I would support moving forward. Um, and the rest of the council and get everybody's opinion. Jennifer? I just wanted to uh, express that I still would like to see more public outreach meetings. It looks like you guys had one, and I'd like to see at least two um, public outreach meetings because not everyone uses Facebook and those things. So, um, but this is an excellent presentation. Um, so, good job on that. Councilmember Keating, then Vice Mayor Cuby, then Councilman Granville. I agree with the mayor as far as, um, you know, a preference for, for number two, but. You know, if there's a way to make number three work too, that would be fantastic. Uh, so I just want to throw that out there. Um, you know, as you work, look at the numbers and and try to make that that, that a reality. I just also would like to say that you know I'm really appreciative of you guys bringing this this back to us. Um, you know, I know roundabouts aren't necessarily the most popular thing, but they uh, you know clearly they're safer. Clearly, they move traffic faster, um, which I think. Is something we all can be appreciative of so you know i appreciate the out of the box thinking on this and, and you know taking steps towards solutions to what are troublesome intersections in the city thank you thank you so okay. vice mayor then councilman Grandal. so so it's clear that there's an urgency for the priest and grove um, roundabout so i would support moving forward and as regard the other roundabout i'm I'd like to know what we're gonna, what's going to supplant it. So I don't know if we should push it off the table or just continue through the process and see. Is there what, a light there? No, no, I don't mean physically supplant it, but what in the CIP will. <coughs> I think that's answered. That money that was appropriated for it would go to oh, the Priest and Grove to Parkway Roundabout to, to complete. The that way, we only had to come up with an additional hundred thousand. So. But if we wanted to move forward with both, that's another right. million. So that's option three is a different. So issue. what is going to? If we decide we want to do that, what would get kicked off? Right. I just don't. We'd know have that to look answer. at what was, what, what's what's mm -hmm. currently been proposed and how we would how we would structure that. We'd have to come back and show you what the CIP would look like mm -hmm. with well, the additional we be million. Doing that anyway, wouldn't we? When we we are. It? Yeah. I mean, if we got yeah, direction, if we got direction tonight to do option three, we would definitely come back and we would have we would have that those numbers for you what that would look like in the CIP. And they're going to even in the budget if we decide to move forward to knowing that you take parts of that. I mean, we still have, it's not fully funded. We're still asking for another $100,000 just to finish the preschool Parkway right, roundabout. Right. So, but the, even with that in play, we're going to have a whole list of items on the CIP that we're going to be looking at that the say, we only have so much money, we have so much money that are requests that are being asked. So, Right, so I, I support option two, but wanted to ask you about the public engagement aspect. There were, you sent out mailers, uh, you send out cards to people. You didn't really <coughs> use social media to get people to the meetings, right? Correct. That's correct. No, we did uh, mailers to all the properties in the in the area. And then we did also reach out to uh, the neighborhood chairs. They have some great listservs and such. So we, we really did uh, a, a great job, in my opinion, of, of trying to reach out and, and encouraging neighbors to tell their neighbors if they couldn't make the meeting to then go on to the website and still provide feedback. Hey guys, guys I got to, everyone has to have a chance. So Council I want Randall's to just say respectfully, I think they've done the due diligence for the public engagement. Oh, and to, just, have if we're moving forward, Priest and Grove, there's no point in asking again. We've decided and we have had public input. And for the other one, we're going to delay it because we don't have funding, at least for maybe this fiscal year. And so I yes, don't really so see the point of having another meeting. It's, I'm not saying having another meeting now. I'm just saying in the future, I would like to see two public um, outreach meetings. Um, when when it's, when, yes, or in, in any dis discussion that involves the public, uh, anything that's going to change the public's uh, experience of their neighborhood. Councilman Granville. Uh, thank you. So one of the things that uh, was missing from this as a frame of reference for me was the, the typical signage that we do, the big green ones that light up 
what's the general cost of doing an intersection? And I'm not going to hold you to this, but within a range, what's the cost of doing an intersection that way compared to a roundabout? With a traffic signal? Yeah, the way we would traditionally do like rural and university or something like that. Yeah, it, it, we, we've been saying for a while about $400,000. Um, now escalated cost is probably closer to half a million dollars. But there's also a huge maintenance component that goes along with that. And so one, one of the nice things about roundabouts is um, you, you pay, might pay a little bit up front, but if you look at it on a long-term basis, you have to make sure you have your landscape maintenance and such, but um, you're not, you don't have the expensive equipment that has to be maintained. We have our technicians go out there a couple times a year annually and P, uh, PM, sure. the equipment fails and such. So um, that is one thing that, about roundabouts is you do pay a little bit more up front, but there's the long-term, the maintenance. Uh, so in, the, in the case of the college location, given that it's got much lower numbers, I know right now it has a signal. It's one of the only places in the city that has sort of an old school signaling system anymore. Um, would it warrant uh, eventually, assuming that it never gets a roundabout or whatever, mm -hmm. would it warrant one of the larger treatments or would it, or does it not have traffic flows that would ever warrant that kind of um, sort of full signalization? So are you speaking of the modular signal versus the more tapered, smaller signal? Yeah, right signals? now it's like the, it's like something you'd see in like Mayberry where it's like a string thing with the light hanging off of it. Have a few of those Yeah, one, it's one of the very few left. Uh, is it have track? Like, I'm sure you guys have some numbers about like when, a, when an intersection gets this many cars, we want to go to a full signalization process with the giant green thing that hangs over and the whole... Does it warrant that treatment, or um, is it such that it it would probably not ever get that treatment anyway? It, it, with the current numbers right now, if we, it was a brand new intersection, it would likely be a four-way stop. Like so a stop it, sign. So historically, there okay. there, was, there 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 must have been higher numbers. That, um, that signal's been there for many many years. I tried Looks to like document it. how long it's been there. Yeah. And uh, so, it, but we don't believe. And it could go to a four-way stop. We, we think that what's existing there is probably uh, uh, better than that. But, but we think that a roundabout could also function in that place. Okay. To clarify, the numbers don't dictate the outcome in terms of what type of signal it is. Typically, within more residential areas, we've gone with the smaller signals just because the larger signals are so large um, that this, the visual impact has, been, has I mean, been so much more. So that it really doesn't have to do with the numbers, okay. if that's what you're asking. I was just trying to figure out if this is money we were going to have to spend someday anyway because we were going to upgrade the signalization or not. And it sounds like the answer is probably not. <coughs> the underground infrastructure would have to be upgraded at some point because eventually the conduits start to fail with the um, electrical conduit pulled through. So we would have to do that, but we probably would not move in the direction of a modular signal. Okay. And then the other question I had is I noticed on some of the feedback for the priest location, somebody referred to, uh, they said, this is our second treatment, and the first one didn't work. Uh, I can read it to you. I, second I, one? Uh, it said, uh, I have lived in the general vicinity of this project for almost 40 years, a number of years before Grove Parkway even existed. I witnessed the gross failure of the first intersection and have been forced to deal with the current or second configuration ever since. And I... I do you, I know it's going back a long time. He said this person said 40 years. Mike, do you know what that initial treatment was? Was it a light? No, I believe what originally Perhaps happened was, a roundabout. was um, priest currently curves into. Yeah, it's a weird configuration. That you can see there's kind of anywhere. a um, retention basin by the Fuddruckers huh? over there. I believe that the intersection used to run straighter, so priests would come in, and I believe that it was changed to curve in at a more of a 90 degree angle. A lot of people to merge with traffic. But <coughs> at no point from uh, the research I've been able to do was ever signalized, so it's always been okay. uh, kind of free flow. Okay, and then one last question, and then I'm done. Is there any concern, uh, is there any, I'm just curious the reasoning of, if this is our first uh, roundabout of this type to put in the city, why not put it, I'm, I'm, I'm not leading, I'm really asking, mm -hmm. why not put it in a lower traffic area to see how it performs before putting it in a higher traffic area? Like why not build up to the, its best use, you know, to its instead heavy of, traffic use? Instead of southern, instead of Friesen. Right, because there's a lot less traffic on college. And so if it's the first one you're putting in, why not put it in a lower, mm -hmm. lower car turnout, see how it goes, and then put it in a higher car turnout? 
and, and there might be a good reason for it. I, I'm genuinely asking. I'm not. I like, say we, we feel confident research. with the design of a roundabout. Um, there's experts who do yeah. this regularly. They're across the country, so the information we have in the research says that even putting it in a higher volume area. So you don't it feel like this is still, something you're figuring out. You've yeah, got pretty good. We data wouldn't to recommend it if we didn't feel confident with okay. moving. That's all I needed to hear. Thank you. The only thing that we want to make sure is um, working on Robert educating our, our, our community as much as possible if it, if it is to move forward on this. And I, and I did fail to point out, um, we did do the, uh, provide information to our Transportation Commission, and um, they uh, supported option two. Okay. So, that sounds good to me. Council Member Arredondo Savage. Mayor, just, has not spoken yet. just for the record, I was just going to say I agree with you in, in moving forward with number two, and thank you for the work. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Navarro. Thank you. And just, I know this might be a hot topic, but I know we're talking about cost and offsetting costs. And I've seen this, or I've heard about this in other cities, but if you were to do a cell site on a roundabout artistically, and it might work in some areas, I know, I'm just throwing it out there. Like Which, a totem pole? Well, pine yeah, could, like a pine, <laughs> not a pine tree, but I'm just saying it, it's, I've seen it artistically done, and I, I know that in the lake area, they were talking about increasing the cell activity. Uh, around the lake in the service, just throwing it out there. Not, by the lakes. No, no, the I'm going through the roundabout. And I'm looking at my yeah. phone. It's not good. Not yet. Yeah, it's, it's one of those community outreach. Throw it out there if that works out. But there, it might be interesting <laughs> just to see what uh, the cell companies might offer or have. That's hot topic. Councilmember Adams. I just have a question uh, about the tra traffic flow with the roundabouts. Um, in general, um, would you say that traffic flows better with, with roundabouts as opposed to the signals? Yes. Um, well, the, yes, to a certain extent. No, that's fine. It, there's a certain volume threshold where they start to break down, and so we would never propose a roundabout at Rural and University or Rural and Broadway or one of these so major, major arterials. So you, the traffic volumes do matter. So as far as like pre-single parkway, well, although those traffic volumes might seem high, we're talking about in the thousands, um, they're relatively low from an a intersection standpoint when you're comparing to some or more arterial arterial. And so the, and that's, that also plays into whether you go with a single lane roundabout or a multi-lane roundabout as, as traffic volumes. But um, the, with, the, with the right traffic volumes, uh, they function very smoothly. And from a safety standpoint, um, I had this in the original presentation, but I left it out for this one for, to make, move on a little faster. But um, what we're really removing is the direct left turn crashes, which are the ones that we really see high severity crashes. And so um, the, the roundabout, everybody travels in a counterclockwise um, around, and the type of crashes that you see are generally um, small sidewipes and fender bear, vendors, as opposed to our major intersections where you have high speed crashes and the T bone crashes, which really result in severe crashes. So, so I think the roundabouts, it's very important that we, um, we use roundabouts and in different intersections where you guys de deem it's appropriate because we get a lot of traffic complaints from our residents about you know, just being stuck in traffic and things, and roundabouts do, in fact, um, increase the traffic flow. Um, so thank you very much for clarifying that. Thank Great you. job. All right, option two. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next is Sea Life Development Agreement Update. Mr. Smith. Mayor, members of council, my name is Alex Smith, Deputy Director in the Community Development Department, and I'm here today to provide you with a biennial Sea Life Development Agreement update, which is required by state statute. Table 1, which is also in your memo, been like shows that revenues exceed the rebates required by the development agreement, and therefore the city is now and will continue to be in compliance with the state statute. Thus concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Don. All right. Next is any future agenda items from the council. All right. Next item on our agenda is a call to the audience for the committee of the whole. Items listed on this section under 4A and B. Audience members do have up to three minutes to address the council. If you would like to speak, please fill out a speaker's card, which you can find in the back of the council chambers. I do not have any cards, so is there anyone in the audience wishing to address us on any of the items listed on our committee of the whole? Anyone? Seeing none, I'll close that portion. Uh, uh, the next item is items 4A, uh, items ready for city council direction and status update. The Broadway corridor revitalization, urban mixed use redevelopment opportunities along Broadway Road. Keating? Yeah, I mean, I, we're on this committee, but 
Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the Broadway Revitalization Working Group is looking at different ways we can sort of create a sense of place and a, a destination out of Broadway Road, and we're you know we're exploring uh, different things like bringing new businesses uh, into that area, um, you know, and improving infrastructure in that area. And one of the things that we were looking at you know, <coughs> we added to the CIP for I believe it's five years out, or it looks like it's going to be six years out. Um, we want to you know, do some work on the pavement and the sidewalks to address some ADA deficiencies, uh, expand the sidewalks, um, add, you know, we're looking at things like adding uh, art installations as, you know, Broadway is, is kind of a gateway to the city um, off the 10 there. And um, things like, um, you know, uh, pavement treatment as well that would, you know, kind of be part of the bigger plan. This would be 10, 15 year project of, of creating kind of a, a sense of, of individuality of that area. So when you come down like the Mill Avenue, you know, the, the, uh, the pavement is different, the signage is a little bit different, you know, and we're looking to replicate something like that along Broadway Road. So that's kind of what, as you know, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, what we've been working on in that group thus far. What's the ask? I mean, because I... The ask is um, for to... The request is for three hundred, or excuse me, three million eight hundred ninety-nine thousand dollars to be added into the CIP budget for the Broadway corridor improvements, as 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 outlined and be appropriated for the project in the CIP for years twenty twenty-two through twenty twenty-three and twenty twenty-three through twenty twenty-four. I just I think that area needs a facelift. It is the entrance to our community, and it doesn't look very good. And I guess I would like to see more done than just pavement improvements. Um, I couldn't agree more, Councilmember Adams. Thank you. Um, any other suggestions that came forward in, in this? Um, we're still kind of flushing that out in the group right now, but there is, um, you know, there's a couple of different things that we're looking at um, as far as uh, maybe select rezoning for light industrial and commercial properties, um, but that hasn't been decided yet amongst the group. Okay. What is the vacancy rate in that area for businesses? Yeah, I don't know. Is, is Donna here? 11%. And what is the city's average? Uh, it's much less than that, right? It's like 4%. Percent. Industrial parks, you get to clarify. Industrial versus the rest. Well, you're I think that area is 11%. In other parts, I think it's less than 5%. That's class A. Yes. No, 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 no. I'm talking industrial. No, no. Industrial total. Donna Kennedy, Economic Development Department. Vacancy rate, we have um, distinguished throughout the city in this location, this general area, it's a sub area of the whole market, it's 11% vacancy rate. An average vacancy rate in Tempe is about 5%. Some areas is less, some areas is slightly more, but it's a high vacancy rate in this area. So we're, that's why we're paying attention to how we can do business attraction and how what the plan would look like for redevelopment of the area. In, in that area, we did have one major <laughs> Company leave. Um, yes, one of I mean, the I larger mean major. properties. I mean, it was there. one of the larger properties, which was Safeway. So if you let's say Safeway didn't leave, then it'll be probably I mean, back in the norm of the five percent. But well, that's. I mean, there's well, other vacancies there too. Safeway didn't take six additional percent of buildings with it, though. Right. It's, that was just one company. That was just. Looking they had different now. businesses in there. They still have the milk distribution oh, in yeah. there, but there is partially vacancy in there. Yeah, I think a hundred thousand square feet. Well, I, I guess I'm just concerned. Uh, what would you suggest for um, addressing this high vacancy rate of 11 percent? It just seems like it's unacceptable and we're losing a lot of tax dollars as a result of not having a more vacancy. Rate we are area. analyzing the area for what types of businesses are in these industrial buildings. Some of the building stocks are old building stocks where they don't have the high ceilings. The um, industrial users that come in prefer a different type of um, yes. more updated technology project or projects that offer for where they can bring in their heavier equipment and their smaller lots where they want to go maybe more into a campus style. But there is still some room for, I mean, industrial uses in this area are thriving, some of them that are still located in there. It's just some of the smaller lots. We're, we're looking maybe to look for mixed use to bring in their mayor, I know. So one of the things Councilmember Member added, we'll have a bigger report back from this committee. This is just a partial because the budget's coming up. And I do agree that 
this is an area that needs to improve. <coughs> One thing I would ask our staff is we do have an ADA program in place for sidewalks, and I know it's based on rank on, er on, on areas of the city. I'd like to know where that is because that's <coughs> also calculated as part of the money that we're looking at. And we haven't really dove in it entirely. That's why it's it's there. It's a place where it's, it's in future years out. And I think it's important that we have this conversation with all the lists of the CIP projects because we also have a, a list of $27 million in deferred maintenance and buildings that for our asset management program that we have. So there's a lot of lists that's going to be coming forward that we're all going to look at. So I think the ask is just to put this so we have an idea of where this is. And, and it's not till the future years. You said five, 2000, what, 22? 2022, 23. And that could change. I mean, it, it, but that's, we're looking at it in a queue. There's a lot that's going to be done in, that, in those areas. And we are looking, that area along with Smith Industrial Hub is a innovation hub. Mm -hmm. And it's also a um, opportunity zone, which is we're already meeting with certain types of developers and with GPEC to really help spur up the interest in the industrial part of that, as well as mixed use, which is what the council group is looking at as well. Councilman Grando? Uh, yeah, so first off, I, I think this is a great location. I used to drive this street every day, and I was always amazed that uh, there were no sidewalks. It's got to be the only part of the whole city where there are no, except for the areas, you it's know, small. yeah, except for a few very small areas. Uh, and so when the complex on the south side of the road moved in, like a Starbucks and some other things, my first thought was, really here? Like, wow, uh, okay, I'm glad, but I was surprised. And so whatever we can do to revitalize it, I think, is great, starting with sidewalks. Um, the other thing that I think would be helpful is, since I've been on council, there's always been sort of a running list of federal grants that we're applying for. Uh, whether at first it was, you know, Hardy, and then it was Broadway, uh, and then it was University sort of by Harlow's. Um, I haven't seen or heard in a while sort of where that queue is. Or even what the, or like 8th Street is another one that's set for federal funding, all that's been held up a little bit. I haven't, I think it would be an interesting thing to slot that into this, that queue. Uh, and I'd also be curious even where we are in that. Like, I don't I'd like I don't, to see where we are. I mean, that's a, there's a lot of questions that we're going to be asking. Yeah, because I know, I, that, I know that we there's tend to plan five or ten years out for that federal money to say, now we're going to do an improvement for this street with right. federal money, an improvement with this street. So I think it would be helpful for me to, outside of even this part of it, just to see where that list is and how this might fit into that list. To be candid, I don't know whether it fits with this administration. Well, sure, but, this, but administrations come and go. I mean, this Congress, too. I mean, they're yeah, saying, like, could it could happen, and that's something we're, we can ask. I mean, because I mean, a lot of the times these projects, uh, whether it's the Broadway one that we did or the Hardy one or the University, there are five, seven, ten-year federal right. grant projects. So I think that the ask is that this puts in queue with all the other CIP projects that we're going to have. We're going to have to make some tough choices coming down in March. Vice Mayor? So I would hope, as, as, um, speaking from what you were saying, Councilmember Granville, I would hope that, for instance, the Roosevelt Road is due for pavement and there's no sidewalks there and that's a heavy residential area. I would hope that this wouldn't jump the fence and, and supersede that Roosevelt and other areas where there's heavy uh, resident requests for pavement. So I don't know where it fits in there. But I agree with Councilmember Adams in that I think we need a lot more than sidewalk repaving and I, I was really intrigued what you said about you're looking at some rezoning from industrial to perhaps housing to single mixed family use, or mixed use. Use. mixed use mixed use yes so it'd be mm -hmm. and Donna can can speak really well to this much better than I can but it is my understanding it would be light industrial on the ground floor with a housing element above would there be a way to compose it so it would be workforce and affordable housing yes. That's, that's yes, that is, that is. No, we can't have that conversation because it's not agendized. Could I please respectfully ask you to stick to the item as uh, agendized and I think we're okay, so moving okay, slightly off. So I would just Thank urge you. us, urge the group to go a little bigger. <laughs> and no, we are, it all depends on money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, but to answer your point, I can answer offline after this and have a mm -hmm. conversation, Randy and I can. But I think this is just to get into the queue. Open meeting law. Okay. Yeah, you really can't. I can't. Can I kind of respond to? Um, sorry, Joe. Well, as long as it's long as it's. Yeah. Pertaining yeah. to the item. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna. Because Sonia's looking at me. Well, I wanted to talk about the Super Bowl. We're not. So, yeah. That's not what we're discussing. <laughs> In a good way, I guess. She's like, uh, we can't go there. We all get scared. <laughs> um, Getting that look. Feel it over. I was gonna say, Colby, what was your suggestion again? 
uh, the list of the federal yes. streets yes. Yes. of all yeah. the streets and where they are in our queue. Correct. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, Donna. Isn't this something we're already looking at? I remember we were talking about federal grants. Um, for the streets? Yes. Or, I, I, because that's how Broadway got done, that's how Hardy got done, that's how University got done. Like, we have a long history of... In our first meeting, this came up, yes, and I was like, oh my god, it's going to be 10 years, but that's kind of how long something like this takes. Right. So, <laughs> so I just yes, wanted I to... I believe Shelley did say that. Yeah, so we are looking at federal dollars for, for this project as well. And, but know, also, it would keep it from queue jumping as well, right? Because right. That way, oh, that's another thing I wanted to, to bring up, is, is my understanding that when we add this on to the, the bottom of the CIP list, it will still have to compete with everything else, so it's not like... It's guaranteed to take it, and so it's going to depend on what priority we assign it as a council. Councilman Navarro. Thank you, Mayor. No, I have no problem with that. I, you know, obviously, we have still a lot of more meetings coming up. Me, personally, I have uh, issues I want to bring up to the council, so... You, you do? Know, yeah, sure I do, and it's going to take money. Um, and I think that we all have to kind of keep a track of that and, and our priority and stuff. I don't want to get me wrong, because I, I totally enjoy this district being re revitalized, for sure. Um, but I know that you know, for me, right away walls for, you know, parks or anything else, um, there's going to be some asks and some safety concerns that, you know, need to be addressed too. So put it a placeholder, that's fine. I know that we got other things coming up. I just want to keep a, everyone aware of that. There's still more time. Councilman Aridano Savage. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a, just a couple things. I mean, I think this is really great to have this discussion. And, and I will say that it really literally took 10 years to get Broadway streetscape done. I mean, from the point. How many meetings for I was actually, a mile? That was prior to me even being a council member. I was like on the bicycle advisory committee when we started that work. So yeah, it will take. So don't let that hinder the forward oh, progress. No, That's no. all I would say. But but secondly, I do think it is really important that just because we put it in the queue doesn't mean that it automatically goes to the top. It's definitely got to compete with a lot of other things that are there. But at the same time, I I think that when you have an, an opportunity to interject something exciting in an area. It does create a lot of buzz, and I think when you're able to get that that buzz happening, a lot of things can come from that or organically after that. So, I I think this is a, is a, a great way to really start that conversation and to expand what we've already done on Broadway Road, just even if it's just been for a mile. So, I mean, and maybe it's one of those things we look at piece by piece if we couldn't do the whole thing at one time. But anyway, I I appreciate the work and I look forward to that comprehensive plan because I think that's what's going to be the key of how what things what the vision of that area is going to look like in the years to come i agree thank you so we're okay to okay. put this in the queue in the cip right. next is new items for council consideration clean air and public health and that'd be me so um i want to thank council member granville and council member um john navarro <laughs> for signing on to be <laughs> and joining the group but um this isn't the first conversation we've had as a council about air quality. <coughs> I want to give a shout out to Cliff Anderson, who's been at the Sustainability Commission, who's come to some of my council member events at the library, and who's come before council to speak about the issue. And I want to thank you for being um, so, so keen and interested in these issues, um, council member Adams. But we've seen so many emails and calls from residents concerned about wood fire, wood fire um, fireplaces, whether they're indoors or outdoors, the fire pits and their overall impact in public health. In the case of Cliff Anderson, he has uh, severe asthma, which is impacted by the wood fire in his neighborhood. And um, I know some of you, Councilmember Granville, have studied this issue before, uh, engaging with the Maricopa County Health Department, because they're in charge of air quality for the region. And we look for the city of Tempe to be included in their rebate, so they have a rebate. If you they did that. Rebate, yeah, rebate out. Um, to, if you sub out a gas-fired fireplace for a wood-burning fireplace, because we supposedly have better air quality, we're not eligible. Um, but we know there's hot spots. We know that there are hot spots in our city. And we know that residents will call and complain. Maricopa County will come and check. The inspectors will check. And by the time they come, the problem isn't there because it's a, it's a hot, it's a, it's a point source, a source point pollutant. So the reality is we're really reliant on the county right now for monitoring our air quality. And we don't necessarily need to rely on them completely. We, we know that they only have a few sites, and the, the time has come when we, we see uh, air quality monitors that used to be in the thousands of dollars actually priced in the $30 range, that it's a time for citizen science and for citizens who can get more actively involved in, in their own community's health. So my goal, goal with the group is to identify resources local and regional, and maybe not regional, but national, and um, <laughs> connecting with research being done at ASU. There's a group called HUE, H -U -E, 
healthy urban environments that just got funded, federal funding, they're going to be focusing on air quality in the valley and working with Phoenix, but not just Phoenix, Tempe, and they're doing a lot of that citizen science that I mentioned. So we'll be able to more effectively monitor our air quality and look at potential areas of concern and point source pollutants, whether they come from fireplaces or maybe from gas-powered um, leaf blowers, whatever it might be. And then we can determine what interventions, policy interventions that we can come up with that might <coughs> have the biggest impact on air quality and the public health. And we also, and this is sort of late breaking news, and that's why we had our file revised uh, council memo, but the Bright Cities program came to us. They're a group focused on reducing toxins that impact particularly in infant and children's health and development, and air quality is really key to the work that they do. So they've offered to do a full assessment of Tempe air quality at no cost to the city and to identify areas of concern to sort of help us pinpoint the interventions and sort of get started on this process, which we expect to take about six to 12 months. We don't think this is a, a quick process and we think this is an offshoot and then a contributor to our general climate action plan as well. So the only commitment we have to make with Bright Cities is uh, to sit down with the organization after they've done this study and assessment and listen, listen to their findings and recommendations about air quality and interventions that may be useful in Tempe. And um, so if you do approve this, the moving forward of this working group tonight, I would just ask that you authorize city staff to sign off on the assessment so we can begin to um, have this work start because it does take a couple months and we'd like to get started with it very quickly. With that, I ask for your support and do we want to hear anything from Councilmember Navarro or Councilmember Granville? No, I think you said everything really well. This no. over here. Yes. I just want to comment. Uh, I just was wondering if we could also um, test the quality for the air, airplanes and, and what they emit to our environment. Would we be able to do that? Because um, I know some people have complained about jet fuel. Chemtrails. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say over, yeah. over the city. And could we yeah. have that be one of the things we I, monitor? I think that one of the sort of the hot spots that we could look at, we could try and we want to look at a map of Tempe and working with scientists, see where, where are the point source pollutants and that could be a, a definitely a, a source. I think the Bright Cities would be looking at that as well. Okay, I just, that, that has been uh, brought up in the different neighborhood meetings I've attended, so I think that would be a good thing to um, also monitor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish I could be on the committee, uh, but uh, I you have my full support. Thank you. And I, I think this is great, especially the collaboration with, with uh, the Bright Cities program, mm -hmm. and then obviously Dr. K and some of their, and I don't know how this would tie into our climate um, action plan. Dr. K is nodding. Um, because that may be able to help as well. Yeah, for sure, because we will be talking about some recommendations from this group might be creating a, a council priority <laughs> um, and also um, in goals and also looking at maybe our fleet. Maybe we should be increasing our fleet, the electrification um, of our fleet. There are going to be different well, recommendations. We're already doing that. I mean, yeah. we're looking at that. But when it comes but to air quality, we don't connection. really have a performance measure yet. So I would just make sure that our expectations are not set that we can't. Right. Mm -hmm. I think having. A, you know, engaging the expertise in the bright was it the bright cities program. I think that would be really good, Great. as well as any other climate action. Okay, go, for it. go, for it. go ahead. Go so for it. Yeah, yeah. With bright cities as well. Great. <laughs> like, I hate that. You don't, like, you don't like basic. What did Aaron ever do to me? Yes. <laughs> All right. Next item: <laughs> uh, <laughs> Council Policy <laughs> Development. <laughs> Councilmember Keating. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to form a working group um, to kind of look at, you know, our current um, our current process for proposing new ordinances, and you know, kind of look at the working group uh, model and see if there's room for improvements or hybridization of former models, and you know, what can we do to increase um, public and stakeholder participation in the so-called uh, sausage making process. Um, and, you know, we've heard some complaints from different groups and members of the public that they kind of feel left out at times. So if there's a way for us just to kind of evaluate what we're doing, see if there's areas that we can improve upon that, um, I think that would be uh, time well spent. So um, it's something I would like to take a look at it if, if you agree with me. Councilmember Adams? Yes, I, to I totally agree with you. And I think it will increase our transparency. And that's something that the city needs to continue to improve. And I wish I could be on that committee too, but you guys are already full. But uh, anyway, you have my full support on this issue. And I think it's very important that we get the stakeholders more involved in some of our processes. 
Council Member Grandville. Thanks. I just have a question about the committee since it's a, the way you described it is a little different than when I read it, although I support both of them. Um, so when we first started, there were sort of standing committees, and Joel and I were on a neighborhood committee, I think, for a year or two. And then we went to uh, uh, you know, the Cal system where you propose a committee, and they, initially they were pretty self-contained. Like, <coughs> I want to work on, I don't know, whatever, fill in the blank, small thing. And in the last couple of years, the small task-based committees have really grown to take over areas, right? So the, where normally you would say, oh, I want to look at a street light at this corner. Can I make a committee to look at it? You suddenly are kind of, it becomes the transportation for the city committee. And it's sort of, that's it. If you want to do something transportation, well, too bad. I've rolled it into this sort of omni committee. Um, is that one of the things you'll also be looking at? At e what, I, don't, I don't actually care which way we do it, but just to sort of get some clarity on either a standing committee system or a project-based committee system, as opposed to this sort of, I think that's what people look yeah, at, yeah, this clarity, hydra that grows. I think clarity is our goal here. And we're not sure, you know, what the right answer is and you know what direction is discussions that we're going to have but yeah i think clarity and simplification and you know transparency is our ultimate goal here so i'm not i can't tell you what we're going to propose or come back with sure. we're definitely going to look at you know concerns like that as part of the process okay is there a consensus to explore it? Yes. I, have, I have a few concerns and it seems like you have consensus to move forward but i, I look at the list of the uh the council committees, and they, it seems like it almost complicated. If we did revert to that, and I know you're not suggesting that necessarily, and I have a similar concern to Council Member Granville. If you have an interest in bringing an issue forward and you're not on the committee, then I guess you would bring it forward to someone else to see if they'll bring it forward. Um, but some of these, there's a lot of you know cross-cutting of these committees too that would be confusing. And um, I think that there's an opportunity within a working group to have some frank discussions about issues and potential initiatives with staff where they can really speak their mind about the efficacy of a certain issue. And if you have something agendized and minuted and there's increased staff responsibilities as a result, that you lose that ability to really hear from staff in an informal yet pointed way sometimes. Because there have been times where I've been told by staff that this really is not what we want to look at. And this idea that was brought forward by maybe such resident isn't really working for this reason. And it's hard to be that frank sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have that concern as well. Um, so I mean, I'm interested to see what you want to do with simplification, but I'm kind of worried about what the impact will be. I also think there's been opportunities where someone's come and we've had a working group, the Tobacco 21 group, this happened. And someone says, hey, I'm in town and I'm the Tobacco 21 group. Can we meet? And we could quickly get a meeting together. But if it's something within the these new committees, it would be, nope, we had to have had this agendized and put on you know, a public announcement at least this many hours before. You know, you'd be ham hamstrung to have those meetings when you have serendipitous opportunities to meet with stakeholders that are an part, important part of the process. Right. I, you know, I don't, we don't want to lose any of those opportunities, certainly. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to complicate the process at all. I and mean, I look at this list, too, and it's kind of like, well, you know, what is this? But I think there are areas of improvement that we can make within our existing system. Or, and I wasn't on council when we had the committee system, so I really don't know how that worked or what the, those processes were. But I think it's something worth revising. And, and I wouldn't be supportive of anything that, that you know, left staff in a place feeling like they couldn't give us their honest opinion about you know, this direction or that direction, or one that would hamper any sort of <coughs> member of the public or, or stakeholder or you know, somebody in town from a meeting that you know, wants to talk to whatever working group um, that might be appropriate, uh, we want to make sure those opportunities still exist. So I, I don't think anyone's suggesting we go one way or the other. We're just kind of going to take a dive into it. And maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's not. But it's something worth, worth taking a look at. OK. I have a quick yes. a comment. Councilman Adams, but I think is there, is there general consensus to really explore it and then come back? And obviously, nothing's going to happen without the entire council having a, a, a conversation. And I was on staff when we did have the subcommittees, and we never felt like we couldn't um, talk in those meetings. So just just so you know, um, it was a very transparent process, and I never remember um, being told or felt like we couldn't talk. So just FYI, for history. All right. Directions to move forward. Next, items in progress. I don't know if there's anything to be updated, but... Councilman Grandville. I just have a comment on, uh, it's not even my committee, but item 4C2 uh, started off, it's the uh, Animal Welfare Laws and Programs, started off as 
to go back to your previous one, uh, Councilmember Keating, started off as a tethering and pet tag pilot program. It's now grown to uh, animal tethering, animal hoarding, pet tags, city pet fair, interactive city map, barking dog ordinance, pet abuse registry, <coughs> and relocation of the city of the county animal shelter. Uh, oddly enough, the one thing that I that I that that I asked that got put on it isn't on that list, so I would just ask for the correction. And that is uh, six months ago, I brought up an issue about dog parks and seeing how we compared to other peer cities. Uh, and that was all agreed that it would get rolled into that committee. So if it could just be edited uh, to be sure that that's also included officially as part of that committee. Yeah, that should be on there because uh, we've talked about it, the dog parks mm -hmm. in the committee. So that's a high priority yeah. for me. And should, yes, I agree. So we I don't know why it's make not sure, on there. We should make sure that we have, because I'm not sure we actually talked about it in a working study session. Okay. So we should make sure about it. Because um, I brought up the we, we brought up the dog park one, and then the, I thought the consensus of the group was to roll it into that committee since you were already working. Well, on it. I mean, I think right, it's up in the committee, right? I mean, but I'm happy to look at it. Yeah, and I I want to speak to that issue because you'll notice we do have a wide range of, of issues that we're dealing with with the animal welfare group, and we're very excited about the interactive city pet map that we hope to present to you, um, and we are getting close to our hoarding issue um, initiative, uh, but. We are going to be meeting to actually prioritize so we can really move forward with a lot of these. The reason why we have so many issues is because there's no one place in the city government where animal issues are focused. I'm, I'm fine have, with the committee. We have, you know, I just want to explain to the public, we have, you know, we have uh, officers in charge of animal abuse, but we don't have one distinct department that has the charge. And that's one thing we're looking at, maybe creating an alliance of employees, because we know we have a lot of pet-loving um, employees that may want to participate in some kind of alliance that consults on these issues. Appreciate the correction. So we'll just add the dog parks officially into this working group, correct? Is that, are, do we have consensus? Well, are we allowed to do that? Consensus? Well, you're talking. Yeah, so sorry. At this point, you're talking about where this committee is going, where this group is going. So if you want to say that you want the group to move forward with the inclusion of the <coughs> item, that, that's fine, but that's about as far as we can go. Okay. So okay. can you repeat the, how you want? So I would like dog parks included in on this working committee. Is the council okay with that? Sure. Okay. We're good? Okay. Thank you. All right. It, anything else? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Manager, do you have any announcements? No announcements. I just want to remind everyone, check the city webpage for traffic. This weekend we have the Rock and Roll Marathon on Sunday at Tempe Beach Park. So just make sure you look to the city website for street closures and so forth so we don't want to catch anyone off guard. Um, and I want to thank our staff and the Human Relations Commissions for a wonderful MLK breakfast. Mm. I know Rosa and Jenny and her staff at, at, at Ms. Hutchinson. Thank you guys so much and for all the sponsors to really make, I think we, we had a tremendous turnout for the MLK breakfast on Monday. Um, and have everyone, we have M, the actual MLK day is this Monday. The city will be closed. <coughs> um, just want to let everyone know that as well. With that, we are adjourned. Did you get the dog? No, they keep on talking.